to, to we'll work out how we can transition. That was a smooth transition, Pedro, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. <laughs> I think we're waiting for Saul, but I'm not sure if he can come in. So I thought I press the button and see what it does, and here I am. <laughs> Beautiful. That worked. You all appeared. Excellent. <laughs> well, I think, yes. um, look, Pedro, I think um, what we can do is introduce you. I, I think it's we can we we can forget about Saul. We'll see him later. And we've probably seen enough of him <laughs> today him anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yes. But um, Pedro, over to you. Really excited about um, seeing what you can say about the future of leader, future leader. I'm, I'm continuously trying to figure out what the uh, what the north star of leadership is. So don't Looking be forward old. to it. <laughs> don't be old. Thank you so much. <laughs> no worries. Well, thank sure, you. Thank you so much. I am sure everyone's head is spinning and buzzing and you're already thinking of how can we bring those ideas back and change how we work. And those couple of days are the perfect example that technology is changing the game. It's changing the way how we live, we act, we interact, and of course, how we work, which means that we have to challenge the way how we think of leadership. Now, the question is, how do you lead in this more complex, connected and more rapidly changing world of work. This is exactly what we are going to discuss over the next 30 or so minutes. I want you to come with me on a journey and I want to welcome you to the next world of work and the role of the future leader. What's the one skill that you need to master, no matter your role, your profession, your level of seniority? And since I'm all for practical steps and want you to put theory into action, I will also share with you very tangible action steps that you can take afterwards straight away, that you can level up your leadership skills. But before we go forward, I want you to come with me and take a step back. Now, for those who remember that, Back to the Future, one of my favorite movies, Marty and Doc in the DeLorean, you will also remember that. <laughs> we were working next to each other as a team without the face masks without social distancing. We were applying for roles that were in commuting distance. Now, back then, could you have imagined working and acting like this, working on a global scale from wherever, working around your personal commitments, being able to run an entire business from your mobile phone, immersing yourself into virtual reality and fast track your own learning progress. And most importantly, could you have imagined making money taking selfies? Well, I definitely could not. And for most of us who can remember that era, they would also remember that era, the traditional career ladder. Fact is, most of our education, our foundation education, has been primed us to progress linear. We are graduating from university, we are getting an entry-level job, gaining some experience, working our way up, earning the stripes, getting the promotion to eventually land the dream job and then retire. Well. That's not the case anymore. It has been replaced by a new reality. And interesting enough, a research from the Foundation for Young Australians suggests that an average Gen Z talent, so our next generation, is going through 17 different jobs across five different careers. So the traditional way of progressing and only going back to university to upskill, it doesn't work like that anymore which is an amazing opportunity for us to also rethink what career success actually looks like because it's not always going upwards. It could also mean sidesteps. Sometimes it could mean to take a step backwards to then fast track the next journey. And I'm not sure if you have ever heard this concept or this technical term, but I'm quite sure you would have exp experienced or explored it at some stage in your career. The Peter Principle. Now, the traditional education uh, pr primes us for us to progress linear. However, what of often also happens is that we're getting promoted to the highest level of incompetence. And that's the Peter principle. And this also happened to myself. When I graduated from university with a master in marketing, I thought my one and only career is fast moving consumer goods industry doing brand and product marketing. And it was the case for the first 10 of my years of my career. And I can remember it as it was yesterday. It was a Friday morning and my manager called me to the office and she asked me to go out for lunch with her. I was like, oh yes, it must be time for the next promotion because I worked really hard. Well, 
you may imagine that this didn't happen. <laughs> Instead of my promotion, I got put on a performance improvement plan. Me, the first one in, the last one out. I took on every responsibility and every role there was. I got things done. And I was the one who was put on a performance improvement plan. And I didn't have a plan B. I didn't see that coming. So you can imagine my world turned upside down. And the feedback that she gave me completely changed my way of thinking and with that the trajectory of my career. What she told me was that, yes, you are a fantastic worker. You are getting so much done. However, you're not building strategic relationships. You're not influencing at a level that you are supposed to influence. And at this stage, I was in a very senior role. Now, I progressed in my career probably a little bit too quickly. So I was always focusing on my technical skills. And because I could outwork every single other person, I got promoted until the highest level of incompetence. I didn't upskill in my soft skills, which is a very important part. And in this role, I was in a senior role. I was managing 18 different boards across Australia and New Zealand for a very large brand. Now, my ego was bruised, <laughs> to say the least. Well, so much so that I decided to get out of the industry completely. And I got into recruitment through an introduction from a friend. Every agency rejected me because I didn't have the experience. But this one agency saw something in me and said, you know what, we give you a chance under the one condition. You need to start a new practice. It's digital. Apparently, it's a thing. We're not sure what it is. You don't have a client or a candidate, but this is the condition you can have the job. I thought, you know what, I'll figure it out. So I said yes to this. And because I progressed in my marketing career so quickly and was in strategic roles, never in the hands-on roles, I actually didn't know everything that has to do with digital marketing or social media. So what did I do? Of course, I Googled, what is SEO? <laughs> this is literally how I upskilled in the first stage. But then because we didn't have any candidates or clients, I also got, went out to the market and I interviewed the brightest in that field, in digital technology. Hundreds of in candidates I interviewed. And what I saw was that the brightest and the most experienced and most educated talents often missed out on promotions, on pay rises. Often they didn't even get interviewed or invited to the interview. And I saw the common pattern that it wasn't just me, this awkward, introverted person who didn't have any clue what the other people perceive about me. But it was a common trend, especially amongst what I always call the left brainers. We want step by step everything. This is how we function perfectly. And this is when I got more fascinated into personal branding. What does it take for us to position ourselves and communicate in a way that makes sense to others? Because I was in a different tech space, those talents, they could speak tech language. But because I didn't understand a word, I asked a lot of questions. So because I could tell their story and sell them into my clients' opportunities, they got the roles. So I thought, what if there is a method how I can systemize this clarification of your point of difference and value that you can then communicate to your decision makers? And this is what I've been doing full time uh, since 2017. And we've been lucky enough to work with some of the most forward thinking companies from Domino's and Zero and Microsoft. And I always say our job is now to future proof companies and their leaders and help them to go from expert to trusted authority. And in the workshop that we just heard before, trust came up. And this is also a big part in what the future of leadership looks like. Now, where are we now? We've taken the DeLorean and COVID-19 literally fast forwarded 10 years within 10 days. Because we've seen those trends, quote unquote, coming for quite some time. And this is one of the best reports that I've ever seen when it comes to future of work skill sets. And I want to point out the date that it has been released. It's 2011. So for the last decade, we've seen those trends coming. The trends meaning the rise of smart machines, meaning technology, a new media ecology. We see audio only applications popping up like Clubhouse, one after the other. We are also seeing a globally connected world. We literally work with distributed teams. And this is now what I don't want to call new normal. It's the next normal. We're not going backwards anymore. People are already used to 
being able to work around the personal commitments and not having to commute. In fact, only 14% of full-time employees say they want to go back full-time to an office. So we are going to see a hybrid world. And at the same time with technology, everything is more transparent. Customers have high expectations. They expect a much higher quality, but also more transparency when it comes to the leadership team. And the pace of change is picking up because technology is stacked on top of each other. It took 75 years for 150 million users to adopt the telephone. It only took 12 years for 50 million to adopt the mobile phone. So we see already everything is now fast forwarding much quicker. And also there's a lot more pressure on companies because truth told we are in a more complex, connected and with that more competitive world of work. And it is only the beginning. We are right at the beginning of a next era. What we're seeing because of this more competitive marketplace is that organizational structures are getting leaner and more agile. That also means hierarchies are getting flatter and we can't necessarily work our way six levels up. And this is not it. A recent CXC global trend study has also found out that 77% of all executives researched believe that the gig economy and freelancing will replace full-time work within the next five years. So it might not be here right now, but as we saw, everything is fast tracking much quicker than we used to be. So it's just rethinking the way how we see career development and leadership because it requires a new type of leader and a new way of leadership. So the question is, what is leadership to start with? So I did what every sensible millennial would do. I Googled it <laughs> and I got 2.75 billion explanations and results. Wasn't quite the answer that I was looking for, clearly. The one answer that we do know, however, is that simply being better, having more education, having more years of experience isn't good enough anymore because we are competing with a global talent pool and knowledge and years of experience and degrees have become a commodity. Truth told, there will always be somebody who is smarter, who is more experienced, who is more educated, who is cheaper, who is faster, you name it. So the next world of work, the marketplace requires a different type of skill set. And that comes down to collaboration and influence. Now, I did the next step What I, uh, in terms of researching what the uh, contemporary leadership is all about. And I looked at three examples. Paul Davidson, Clubhouse co-founder. Clubhouse is an audio-only application. It was launched last year. It's a billion-dollar company. He built this with a team of 10. And this morning, I was in a Clubhouse room with the global CTO from Accenture. And this is the next uh, way of communication. We've got access to some of the smartest people in their field and can ask questions directly. Mel Perkins, she was in the media today. Canva is worth $55 billion after a $200 million race. And she has not only transformed the graphic design profession, but an entire industry. And what about Evan Spiegel, the co-founder of Snapchat? Those short, snappy, and educational, but also entertaining videos have changed the way how we communicate. Our attention spans are shorter than before, and that has a ripple effect in every other industry. People are switching off. There's a lot more distraction happening, more notifications. What do they have in common, even though they have completely different industries? They are going first, and this is leadership. Leadership is going first. It's creating change in one way or another. Leadership is influence. Because if we can influence, we can drive change. And, and influence is about affecting or changing something or someone. Every communication is about change. So these days, just saying, do so because I told you so, well, doesn't fly anymore, does it? But if we do want to get things accomplished, and it might be anything from getting the funding for a project, getting the headcount approved, getting a client to sign up, you name it, we need to amp up one skill, and that is influence. Meaning being able to communicate in a way that the stakeholders see it's of benefit for them. And that doesn't require a title. It requires the exercise, the reps of doing it. 
So summing it up, what is the future of leadership? It's the ability to create informal and formal networks and influence beyond titles. This is why I always say we need to become the trusted leader, the trusted authority, not authority or leader by title, because that's old news. Leadership is all about actions. It's behavior. And I know I'm talking to a lot of digital and tech professionals. So I'm the biggest introvert you will ever meet. So I want to focus on the fact that leadership doesn't need to be loud. Leadership is intentional, showing up with intention, behaving with intention. And I also want to challenge your way of approaching leadership. Yes, there is people leadership. And some of us want to drive that path. I, for myself, I wouldn't consider myself as a people leader, even though I led big teams, big digital and tech teams. I enjoyed it, but did it drive me? Mm, not so much. I would put myself into the category of thoughts and ideas leadership. Other people are more driven by getting the results. And I met many of them in my recruitment career. You just gave them a big target for the quarter and they were chasing it like a dog chasing a bone. Others are more driven by creating change. And given we are in this more complex world, these people identify what are the processes that are duplicated by the entire team that slows us down, that costs money. How can I improve that process? Again, we don't need a title for that type of leadership. These are all actions. And what it does come down to is identifying what is my idea? What is the value that I can create? What is my strength that I can leverage? And when I share my idea and create an insight around this idea that makes sense to others, I can then increase my influence and impact a bigger audience. Now, when you say, okay, I get that, I need to know what I'm good at, and then I can communicate with others, but how do I actually do it? How do I increase influence, especially if I don't have a title? Through trust, simply through trust. And trust is built on three elements, credibility, likability, and visibility. Now, credibility is everything that makes you qualified to talk about that topic. And this is where most experts get stuck. They are focusing on getting more degrees and more qualifications and more years of experience. But simply that you are here, that you are immersing yourself into that industry, that you've got hands-on experience already qualifies you as credible. And I will also share with you in a second how else credibility actually comes through when we want to build our trusted authority also outside our own bubble. Now, we can be the best. But if nobody likes us, <laughs> we're not going anywhere. We're not, be, we're not going to be able to influence. Likeability is a big factor when it comes to trust because it shows we've got something in common. This is how we establish trust. And I will also share with you something very practical, how you can become more likable. And finally, visibility. If no one knows of you, they won't trust you, which means you're not going to impact or influence other people. So we need to rethink traditional leadership and focus on the future leadership. No longer is it about me. No longer is it about making myself dispensable. It's about making the collective, the team dispensable. And I also want to challenge the word team. It's not people in our department. A team in this hybrid world of work are people relevant to achieve an outcome, a goal which is why visibility, which I'll come back in a second, is so crucial to build those relationships early on. These days, we are faced with so much uncertainty. No one knows what tomorrow brings. It's not about knowing all the answers and trying to figure it all out. It's about asking more questions and also challenging the status quo. What else can we do to be more competitive? How else can we innovate and reinvent ourselves? It's not about me winning and being the first at the end. It's about creating this win-win relationship, which requires long-term thinking, which is very hard in this very short term and very reactive world of work. But this is exactly what prepares us to be sustainable in the future and be proactive rather than just responding to whatever happens to us. As I said before, it all starts with ourselves, because if I don't know what I'm really good at, what are my goals, what are my strengths and also weaknesses, I can't communicate that. And with that, I can't complement my strength and skills with other people's strengths, uh, skills and strengths and weaknesses. Now, once I know that and I am 
clear about what type of trusted leader, trusted authority I want to be seen as and associated with, I can then communicate it. And I can explain my what, what I can do, how it impacts others and why it's important for them to listen. This way, I can also build my network strategically because I already know what kind of benefit I can bring and how they will be impacted by that. And it's not just then about collecting people into our universe. It's then also fostering relationships long term over short term. And again, I'll show you very, very practical steps how you can do it. But it all starts with this one question that you want to answer. This is your little homework. What is it that you want to be known for? Think about it. It might be that you're the results driven leader. It might be that you are the people leader to get the best out of others. It might be that you want to make an impact with your thoughts, with your ideas and make your message your focus. There is no right or wrong, but it starts here. And it's kind of uh, choose your own career journey. Nobody looks after you in terms of this is the next step because we don't know. It comes down to us taking agency and responsibility over what do I want and how can I create commercial opportunities within my team, within my department, within my organization that leverages my strength, my experience and my skill sets. Now, I spoke to you, there are three elements of trust. And if you have um, done other things in between and have been multitasking, then I want you to come back and want to get a notepad out and take some notes because it's now the time for some actionable tips, tricks and tools. When I say we need to establish credibility, it's not having more years of experience. It's not having another title. It's becoming a translator of your message because simply doing amazing work doesn't mean you have influence over others. Becoming a trusted authority means that you are able to translate what you know in a way what you know can do for others. Becoming the translator. This is also how we build trusted authority. I work with a lot of thought leaders who want to break through in the market and be known for a message. It's not using all the technical jargon. It's about relating it back to people who I want to influence. I had the pleasure to meet Steve Wozniak a couple of years ago co-founder of Apple. And I want to share with you a very short 20 seconds clip, but it is so profound in what he says. So I hope technology is with me and it works. All simplicity. Sim simplicity is, is a main stake of Apple computer and it really does come to both of us. Steve Jobs was only known because he was being publicized, but even long before computers, he knew that I always talked about if I design things with fewer parts, it's easier to understand, it's easier to build, and it works more reliably. It takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of work to do that. But um, the idea is simplicity. We spoke about them long before this. Steve was into also a lot of the Eastern thinking, which says quiet down and and you know and make things for everybody and make them understandable, largely for himself. And this was so profound. This insight, simply saying, make it easy for others to understand, mainly for himself. The more difficult it is, the harder I have to think. And I'm sure you've come across those people who are throwing different jargon and technical terms at you and you have no idea what they're talking about. And this is what makes us feel stupid or silly or not as educated. And this actually reflects badly on your personal brand because your brand is the association, the emotion that you evoke in others. Now, when I speak your language and I can use terms like agile and you know, any kind of technical terms. This is where we've got a common ground. This is what also makes me likable. Now, once I do know what is my message and what is the simplification of it, how does what I know impact others, I can then build my likability. And this is when we talk about cut through communication. Usually what we do is when we have to work as a tech team with the marketing team or with the customer support team or with the legal team, it's kind of me against them, <laughs> but it shouldn't be. Again, team is about who do I need to get on board to get to an outcome? Now, how can we find commonalities? It's about doing research, understanding what the other team is actually measured by. What are their biggest struggles? What do they not understand? We need to break down silos. When we have something that we can use to our advantage, it's also coming down to storytelling. 
I started the keynote with my story that you understand where I'm coming from to make it more relatable rather than showing up and saying, do this, do this and do that. I've unfortunately experienced it very hands on. Also cutting the jargon. We want to make it easy for others to understand it. We don't have to waste a lot of brain power and energy because this is what where people switch off. And nowadays with more digital communication, we've got shorter windows of breaking through with our communication. So cutting down the jargons and using metaphors. So, you know, it's like, it feels a little bit like this is what people can remember because it's what they know. And this is also what makes your message relevant to them. And this is what they remember. And the last point that I want to make this is the most practical part here. Speak in threes. The brain is wired to pick up anything that's in threes a lot easier. When I started my keynote, I said, we are going to discuss what the next world of work is, the future leader and its role, and the three tactical steps that you can take straight away. Three, not more. You can even think of iterations that also has this rhythm in our um, brain. I always say my process is clarify, communicate, commercialize your point of difference. When you present an idea, when, when you want to get a buy-in or funding, you want to cut straight to the point. Today we're discussing one, two, three. People understand that and you already show leadership skills without necessarily having the title for it. This leads us into the last part. We need to build a strategic network. This is also increasing visibility with other teams and departments and their leaders, which again helps us to build trust. If we have had a lot of face contact, you will know, oh yeah, I've known this person, I trust this. Think of a gym. You go there for the first time, everything feels daunting. A week later, you're best buddies with everyone. The same goes for our own department. So how can we collaborate? We need to network. We need to strategically network. And I really want to hone in on this point that networking is working. So often we are so busy doing the doing and just working away long hours that we forget that this is not the only way how we can increase our influence. It's a tiny part. It's one piece to the puzzle. And this is where most people get stuck. They are an expert. They are doing the doing because they're also driven by doing it. However, without the visibility, we can never establish the level of trust that we need if we want to influence, if we want to progress, if we want to get the bigger fundings and budgets for our projects. But we need to do it intentionally because we are time poor and we are busy, which I absolutely acknowledge. But there are certain stakeholders and groups that we want to become friendly with. It starts obviously internally. Your team needs to be on board and your leadership team but also leadership teams and peers from other departments. Organizing a monthly lunch and learn session where we can actually share what projects are we working on, what challenges have we had, celebrating birthdays. This is already breaking down silos and it can be done in a one hour or sometimes 45 minutes um, session, which again, it's so important to be really clear with our communication. What do I work on and how does it impact other departments? But this is one part. We also want to expand our network and build an external network to not get blindsided, to not have the blinkers on. And it starts with having peers in the same or similar industry, but in different organizations and see how they do it. What can I learn? Apply lateral thinking. What works there and why? And how can I apply it to our situation? Who are some of the industry and thought leaders that I can follow and learn from? The, global, the World Economic Forum, for example, is one of my resources that I study intensely. And I'm a bit of a geek. I love research and data interpretation as my hobby. So don't hold that against me. <laughs> and lastly, I would also recommend to build a personal advisory board. People you trust, who you can bounce off ideas and see if it lands with others, or if it sometimes sounds a little bit clearer and a little bit more compelling in your head. But in a second you say it, it's like, hmm? I even confuse myself. So you want to build that. And the last very, very tactical tips that I want to share with you is how can we be a more um, active collaborator? Instead of asking how much can I get from people, it's more how can I give? And giving and creating value comes in so many shapes and forms. And I want you to contextualize it. 
how what does apply it may not be everything is applicable to your own situation but what are one two three actions that you can take straight away time simply listening to feedback from others why are other departments or teams frustrated with you what is the underlying reason we share that we, we give them the feeling that they are important to us even asking the right questions tell me more i'm curious opening the conversation and also initiate or participate in activities rather than saying oh my god i'm too busy i can't do a meditation i can't do the yoga session i can't do the friday afternoon drinks whatever it might be we want to show up and we want to make it an effort to actually get there value creation super easy one of my favorite ways to also stay in touch with my external network is sharing articles that i know are relevant for them harvard business review articles always fly because they are profound you can do it with the team and when you know the marketing team is working on a certain project something might be interesting for them it could be making introductions because again those two people associate you with value creation that they now know each other even sending the agenda we are all time poor so how can we make sure that we are on time also when it isn't your role no matter how senior or junior you are you are taking initiative and that also leads into feedback so it could be i'm sending the agenda but i'm also summarizing it which often also helps us to make sure that we actually understood what was spoken about and having the final um summary saying so what i've understood the next steps are one two three everyone is okay with that you're showing leadership at the same time when you send now the email your name pops up to everyone involved brand billing it's all about visibility staying top of mind giving feedback and giving credit to those who need it is a great way for you to also show humility share it publicly this is what so many people are driven by now to sum this up and i'm right on time i'm very conscious of that the future leader is not a title the future leader is about being the trusted authority not by title but because we trust you and that means we show credibility we can connect the dots we know how to communicate it because i'm using the common language which makes us likable and i'm also visible people know me already because i've passed different doorways digital doorways and if anyone is interested to connect with me further, how could I not use a QR code? I think by now we should all be very familiar how we use it. You get all my contact details there and I would love to stay in touch. And of course, see what you are putting into practice. And this is right on my time, I think, so. <laughs> hey, great, 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 great presentation, Petra. Yes, you are perfectly on time. and. There was so much great content in that. Um, I'll have to grab, I can't wait to grab the video and play it back over and over. I've took notes as well. Um, lots of good stuff in there. And uh, I think um, you have some really good reactions in the chat um, stream. Um, somebody saying, your brand is the emotion you evoke in others. Wow, that's absolutely true. Brownie pond for you. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so um a question i have i mean a lot of what you said really resonated with me as a, a geeky technologist right um we like to be uh we like to immerse ourselves in deep problems we like to be analytical we like to have people go away and don't bother me and i will come up with the answer um but obviously that's the, not that's that's the first part of the problem is how you build your credibility, but then it really plays against the visibility and uh, and all of the networking and those other things you talked about. Um, and maybe that's part of the issue within our industry as techies. Do you see that as, are we different? I mean, do you work with lots of people in other industries? Are we just particularly bad at influence and leadership as techies? or uh is everybody like that well i'm specializing and i always call them left brainer professionals so it could be anyone in different tech this is probably you know 70 80 percent of my audience but then we've also got lawyers and accountants but 
they're all thinking the same. We like step by step. We like processes. We like something that's proven and we like research and we like data. The emotions, the rat brainers, they've got the storytelling more in their blood. It's also not natural to me, <laughs> but it's a skill. And because I had such a shake up moment, I learned it. And because I can relate, I want to focus to work with other left brainers and show that there is a way how we can learn it, a step by step process. And this also requires a little bit of unlearning. There is the saying, the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who can't read and write. It's those who can't unlearn and relearn. And this is something that we need to consider. It's not just having the degrees and the experience. It's about how can we make sense of what we can do for others. And it starts with the department. When we just throw all the jargons out there and the APIs connects here and we get this, huh? look, we know something is wrong because then they're switching off. Then they're thinking about everything else and their dog and their shopping list, but they don't listen to us. And this is where commercial costs happen because projects are not delivered on time or somebody says, oh yeah, I just completed this task. They said, I didn't ask you for that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and it's going to be more competitive. So it's definitely something that isn't trained, unfortunately. No education, no traditional education teaches you what it takes to be successful in your profession. They only teach you the what you need to know in order to get into this profession. But there are, there are two worlds. Yeah, that's that's great. And there are a couple of other things you talked about there. I love the rule of threes. I always use the rule of threes a lot to the extent that sometimes I'm embarrassed that I'm always <laughs> using, you know, three things, but it is such a, a powerful thing. Um, so uh, I, somebody's asking, the question is to me, is there a recording of this session for the rewatch? Um, yes, there will be. So all Happy Days talks go up on on uh, YouTube, um, uh, my phone's just ringing, bad timing. And uh, so there will be ability to rewatch. Um, also, uh, Petra, you put up your QR code, but how, what's the best place for people to find you? QR code, LinkedIn, are you all on all the socials? On all the socials. Well, my main platform is LinkedIn. And this is also one way to be visible, to also build our brand to potential clients to potential talents especially the gen z's and the millennials they are looking up leaders and see what are their thoughts on certain topics there's never been a more dangerous time to be average or to be quiet to not have a standpoint so as i said this morning um the global cto of accenture was in a clubhouse room for two hours and answered one question after the other and people were just soaking up his knowledge. And he explained so much about trust and uh, ethics in digital and technology. And he simplified it for layman's people, you know, people who are not in digital and tech in a way that resonates with them and they understand it. And this is also how we can actually create change. When I'm scared that my job is on the line or I don't understand what technology actually means, I'm putting my back up and say, no, 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 this is not happening. And we can have the best tools and the best technology, but if people are not embracing it and actually leveraging it, it's also a falling threat, which is why a majority, I think 80, 90% of digital transformation projects actually fail because of the lack of adaption from um, people. Yeah, indeed. Okay, thank you, Petra. Um, that was a, a great talk and a great way to end the day.